where I lived, it was, it was exactly that. It was like, but the, what? I don't see color. It was like mm-hmm. the white, white person proverb I heard all the time. I'm like, great. So you don't see me. Mm-hmm. I'm not just erasure <laughs> um, and invalidation of my lived experience. And that's your white privilege that doesn't require you to take color into consideration. And by the way, you're a color too. Hey everyone, I'm Thais Sky. Welcome to Reclaim, a podcast for women by women on conversations that matter. Hello, hello, all you beautiful humans. It's Thais Sky. Welcome to Reclaim, the podcast. I cannot believe that this podcast has turned one this month. We've had over 30,000 downloads in the past year. That's wild to me that all of you are continuing to tune in week after week for this podcast. So many of you have this podcast as your top favorite pods that you go to when you need a little something something. And to me, that is just the greatest honor of like all time. I am just so humbled. I am just so happy. I love being in your ears every week. I love this podcast. This podcast has given me so much life. It is such a beautiful way for me to share my thoughts with you all and for me to be hosting amazing conversations with women who so, like continually inspire me and surprise and delight me with their wisdom, um, like Rachel Ricketts, who is on the podcast today. Um, but before I bring that interview on, uh, thank you for listening in. Thank you for being with me this year. I've had so many incredible conversations with um, so, so many brilliant women. And it just doesn't get tiring for me. So I hope it doesn't get tiring for you because I just come on every week so excited about getting to be in your ear and and getting to share amazing conversations with you. One of the things that's really important for me in the podcast is that the conversation excites me. If the conversation doesn't excite me, I don't share it um, because I'm very, very intentional that you do not have an abundance of time. And so the time that you are investing in listening to this podcast is is cher- it's to be cherished, right? And so I want to make sure that the interviews and the conversations I have are worthy of being listened to. I'm very intentional about that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for being with me. Um, in the one year mark that uh, we've crossed earlier this month of Reclaim the Podcast, I've been thinking a lot about the podcast and I was recently having a conversation with a friend about um, funding and how I was planning on moving forward. And um, he was asking some really good questions about advertisements and, you know, what does that process look like? And I've had a podcast where we had advertisements. um, And I have had advertisements on this podcast earlier um, in the year. And so we were talking about it. And the more I was sharing with him about why I made a commitment, at least to this moment, to not have advertisers the more grounded I felt in that decision. You know, we are so bombarded with capitalism everywhere we go. The internet is becoming so strategic. You say something to somebody and then you're on Instagram and an advertisement for that thing comes up. I mean, it's just wild how customized and and how point like on point advertisers are now being because they have that information. And they collect data and they just know what you want and they're promoting it constantly. I mean, some of that is like really nice because like if I was talking about something and then I see it on Instagram, I'm like, oh, great. Now I don't have to search for it. But at the same time, it's really creepy. And we're just bombarded with ads everywhere. And I want this podcast to be a haven where you don't listen to advertisements, where you get to feel good and like take a break and, and feel like you can breathe and not be worried about bombarded with products and other things, right? I feel really affirmed in that, but that is coming to me at a cost. You know, having advertisement dollars would be really, really helpful in my life right now. Having advertisement dollars would allow for me to sustain this podcast in a bigger way. It would allow for, you know, for me to outsource the production costs that I currently do all the editing for this podcast. It would, it would just give me more breathing room in my life. And so not having advertisement dollars coming in has come at a cost, and it's also in alignment with my values right now. 
So why am I sharing all this with you? Well, because if you want to continue to see Reclaim move forward in the world, I need your help. And the way that you can help me is by supporting me on Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows for you to put in a certain amount of money a month, let's say $5, even just a dollar, and that money goes directly into helping this podcast be the best podcast it can be. That money goes into the rebrand that I had earlier this year in creating a new intro and creating music and creating um, the images, the money that you put into Patreon goes directly into my small business and into supporting making this podcast be a thing in the world. So if you're enjoying this podcast, if you're enjoying the conversations, please consider donating your support through Patreon. I'm playing, continuing to play with different ways that I want to navigate Patreon. What I'm doing right now is I'm offering uh, mini-sodes Uh, that is only available for those on my Patreon. I also offer access to the episodes earlier um, than so the new episodes gets released every Tuesday, right? And you get access to it on Fridays if you are a part of my Patreon. And you also get access to a community call once a month which is a beautiful opportunity for us to come together and support one another in navigating some of the crises that's happening in this moment in time. So if you love the podcast, please consider donating through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. It really makes a difference in the sustainability of this podcast. And I would really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm really hoping to reach the goal of... um, $500 a month, that will allow me to outsource the production of this podcast and it will allow for me to have more episodes out into the world because so much of my time is being consumed in editing the podcast versus recording the podcast. So if I can have someone else edit, then I have more time to record more episodes for you all and have even more conversations that matter. So you can go to patreon.com forward slash Thais Sky to learn more about Patreon and to support Reclaim on that platform. Cool. If Patreon isn't a thing for you and you want to do PayPal or Venmo, um, I accept all things. Um, Anything, every little thing makes a huge difference for the podcast. And you can find me on those platforms at Thais Sky. Cool. Okay. Let's go into the interview. So Rachel Ricketts is a racial justice advocate, intuitive coach, public speaker, and writer. She's an outspoken champion for women of color, educating all humans. <laughs> I love that. Hue is an H-U-E, humans, on anti-racism and inclusion. Her purpose is to help us all better understand our role in perpetuating oppression of ourselves and or others and learning concrete tools for committing to the solution. Rachel hosts online and in-person workshops, including her spiritual activism series, which promotes racial justice, reconciliation, and recovery from racialized trauma, and has helped work with a variety of global brands, including WeWork, Lululemon, and Telus. Her work has been featured in publications such as the Huffington Post, Black Girl in Ohm, and Thrive. And she's presented at international conferences, including SXSW um, in Austin, Me Convention in Stockholm, and Follow Black Women Conference in Omaha. She loves donuts, dancing, and all things metaphysical. And you can learn more about her at rachelricketts.com. Right now, she actually has um, a webinar replay, replay that is available until October 28th. Um, you can go, um, on the show notes to find the links for that. Um, it's called Spiritual Activism 101 and it can, conti- it's basically a continuation of the conversation that we're having on this podcast about how you can do, um, anti-racism work and inclusion work in your life. Listen. I talk a lot about anti-racism on this podcast because I truly believe that that is one of the main work that we are invited to step into, particularly as white women. Um, we will not be free until we are all free. And racism is a way that it is so insidiously like trickled into our society and, and taken hold in such a big way that we have to start there. In fact, I do not believe we can overturn patriarchy. I do not believe that we can get truly equal rights as women if we're not elevating all women. And um, that means making sure that we are holding hands with women of color. Unfortunately, we can't hold hands with women of color, right? We can't support women of color if we're not first understanding the lens in which we carry and how that lens is perpetuating the racism. We are all racist as white people, which means we all have an opportunity to do anti-oppression work, and that begins by looking at our internalized oppression. 
So in this conversation with Rachel Ricketts, we dive into some of that. We also talk about friendships and navigating friendships with people of color, as well as um, the differences between her perspective on the differences between um, black women friendships and white women friendships. It's just such a rich conversation. So as you're listening uh, to this interview, I would love for you to be thinking about, you know, what does it look like for you to be doing anti-racism work in your life? I'm not saying that you have to be on social media. I'm not saying that you have to be doing it in any which way, but it is important for you to be asking yourself, how are you doing this work? And how are you doing this work on a pretty regular basis? Not just reading a book, but like actually implementing it into your life. And if you need some support on like more of the how-tos, there are such an abundance of resources available in the show notes. I also have a a uh, four-part series right now called You're Waking Up to Your White Privilege Now What? with my dear friend Lindsay Ray that you can check out here on the podcast. Um, and those each of those parts uh, has a slew of resources. I am here for this. I'm here for this conversation. You can follow me on Instagram if you want to continue to have this conversation. We as white women need to be holding each other to the fire of doing this work. I deeply, deeply believe that this is how we will be liberated. Because what you'll find is as you're doing anti race racism work, you're going to start recognizing and noticing all the other ways that we uphold um, oppression um, that has nothing to do with race, but may have to do with, let's say, ableism or fat phobia that may have to do with heteronormativity or cis normativity, um, gender normativity, the gender bind. I mean, there's so many different facets where we continue to oppress, but anti-racism, racism is one of the biggest ones and the, the tools that we learn in doing anti-racism work is tools that we can then be using in all the other isms that are out there. So please enjoy this conversation and I'll catch you on the flip side. Hello, hello, Rachel. Welcome to Reclaim. I'm so, I'm so thrilled to have you here on this podcast with me today. Thank you for having me. Honored to be here. Oh my goodness. Okay, so for those who are maybe not so familiar with you and your work, tell them, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I do many things, and I encapsulate all of it. Uh, in the title of racial justice advocate. Mm. I am an intuitive healer, a speaker, and a writer. Um, I'm also a lawyer and um, a donut lover and <laughs> uh, perhaps Solange's biggest fan. So really waiting for that new album to drop. So I'm just gonna say. I love it. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm a black cisgendered heterosexual woman who's out here trying to help change the world and make it a more racially just place for those marginally oppressed, particularly uh, Black and Indigenous women. Mm. How did you go from law and that route into healer and racial justice advocate? How did that, what did that journey look like for you? Or were they all already there when you went into law? I guess I assume for many of us that it's like, go into law. Oh, no, not everything. And then you pursue a different thing. But I shouldn't assume that. Uh, it's, like, it's kind of a both and. So mm. it was from a young age, um, I really believed in justice and mm. fairness. Um, and I went to law school to do international human rights and then I got to law school, um, in my first year of law school, I never really felt like I'd had race slapped in my face so much. Mm. Um, and I learned that the law has very little, if anything to do with justice and fairness. So it was a really, really like one of the most challenging years of my life, not because of education. I mean, it was hard to me wrong, but just because of what I was coming to terms with, you know, like sitting in a law class and we're talking about property law or um, the reasonable person and that judges and the judiciary are objective and neutral observers. And you're like, I'm just sitting there looking around class like, anyone else think this is fucking insane? Like, I know, because the majority of my class is white and predominantly wealthy folks. So um, it was just like, the whole experience was a bit of a mind fuck. I almost dropped out of first year, but I, to be honest, I didn't because I was like, oh, you know, the man's not going to get me. Mm. I will finish. I will complete. Um, 
and I'll, I'll use that knowledge and information. Uh, and I wasn't really sure how. And throughout this whole period, um, you know, my undergrad is in psychology and intercultural education and training. So I've always been interested in racial justice, social justice. Um, and my mother, I'm an only child of a single mother, and my mother had uh, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis <clears throat> when I was 13. And so she'd been sick for a very long time, and she just progressively got worse and worse and worse. And so first year of law school, one of the other reasons why it was the worst year of my life, she was um, unable to move independently, but mm. didn't qualify for social assistance. Um, so we were in an apartment space that wasn't safe for her. Mm. Um, she would fall a lot. So I just went to law school and then came home and studied and took care of my mom for Mm -hmm. a year. It was awful. Um, And so all of that, you know, which is another piece that like um, folks of color often have to endure as a result of, you know, systemic and institutionalized oppressions. Um, I was my mom's primary caregiver, Mm -hmm. mentally, physically, spiritually, um, emotionally on top of, of putting myself through law school. So I just was like, had complete and utter compassion burnout by the time I finished Mm -hmm. before I finished. And so going into a line of law that required such a high degree of compassion, like working for the UN or, um, there was a beautiful, uh, foundation that worked on the downtown east side of where I lived, where there's a lot of, um, folks of color and, um, mentally ill or folks who are struggling with mental health and addiction. Uh, And that was somewhere that I wanted to work, but I didn't have the like emotional capacity because Mm -hmm. I was taking care of my mother, nor could I um, take that role that paid, you know, maybe a fifth of what a traditional law job would pay Mm -hmm. um, because I had to put myself through law school and help my mother financially. So, So I didn't go into um, social justice law when I finished. Um, and so I went into corporate law and, um, I did my best to, you know, do the work that I could do in that environment, blow shit up from the inside as I Mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did that to some degree and I think it was important to have a black woman in those spaces, um, with my perspective and my voice. It is a very white, very male patriarchal space. Um, but it all came to a head one day. My mom was de- very much declining in her health. She was essentially quadriplegic at this point. And I was running on fumes, taking care of her, working like 16, 18 hour days, making white men more money. Very important. <laughs> uh, and um, and I just, I totally hit a wall and I was in a, a shared office space, which is pretty abnormal. Like you're kind of off on your own most of the time. I was in the shared office and my mom had called me in the middle of the work day with some sort of, you know, emergency issue, health issue that had happened that day. Something that was not out of the ordinary for me. Um, but I did what I, I guess I had normally done, which was like to compartmentalize, you know, say, okay, I will be there as soon as I can hang up the phone and kind of like move on with whatever, finishing whatever task needed to be finished before I could like pop out to go help her and then come back to the office. But someone was there to witness that conversation and that wasn't normal. So the person who was there to witness that conversation was like, are you okay? Cause I must've overheard, you know, what was going on. And I was like, Oh no, I'm not okay at all. Mm. <laughs> None of this is okay. Mm-hmm. None of this is okay. Um, and I've given away my, health and my happiness and my sustenance and my nourishment, um, you know, in order to feel financially secure. Um, and so I quit, I quit with no other job lined up and, Mm. um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I knew that I needed time to take care of myself and actually feel like I could properly show up for my mother, I was showing up physically, but I I was surely not showing up, you know, spiritually or emotionally. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I did that and I floundered for a long time doing that as well. And, um, and then long story short, a year later, my mom decided that she um, had had enough and was struggling with chronic pain and chronic illness and quadriplegia and um, that she wanted to end her own life. And it was prior to legislation in Canada where I'm from, um, allowing for assisted death. So 
our options were for her to starve and dehydrate herself to death. So that is what um, we proceeded to do. And I assisted her with that. And I, um, as I say, used my legal training in the most important way I've ever used it to date, which was to uh, fight for her right to to um, go down that path and to be kept um, pain-free and properly uh, cared for during that period of time. And after she passed, um, I experienced like, you know, depths of grief unparalleled, despite the fact that I knew that she was going to die and that I wanted that for her because that was her only um, opportunity for freedom or solace at that Mm -hmm. time. But what I realized is after she died, you know, the whole world had come crashing down on my head despite um, my psych degree and despite all the interpersonal work that I had done, it didn't, it didn't really matter. You can't really prepare yourself for something like that. And so I was missing not only the loss of her physical presence, but also I was grieving and mourning over like all of the losses that I had endured in my life that I just hadn't had true space to sit with because I'd been in fight or flight mm-hmm. like my whole life, putting myself through school and taking care of her and trying to take care of myself working at these, you know, incredible jobs. I say incredible, meaning like they cause incredible suffering. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And so once she was gone, I just sat with the enormity of the losses. And um, really the realization is that that race and gender impacts everything, including my mom's illness and the way in which she was treated throughout her process of wanting to die. Um, and the, the most grief I've ever experienced in my whole life is a result of, of white supremacist patriarchy. It impacts every facet of all of our lives all day long, uh, whether you're conscious of it or not. And so I got real conscious to it. And, um, and now I spend my life, you know, helping women of color move through it, navigating racist patriarchy so that we can, you know, reclaim our rightful voice and place in the mm-hmm. world and society and heal our hearts um, and help white folks do the work because it's time and it's been time for hundreds of years. Uh, and we, we all play a part in bringing about racial justice, albeit in different ways. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. That's, um, that's really, really powerful. Thank you. Yeah. And um, it's interesting how, you know, as you were talking, it's like we can either be unconscious in in our victimization and perpetuation of white supremacy and patriarchy, or we can be conscious to it. And I think um, so many of us um, choose to be unconscious, I guess, on some level, because we kind of fool ourselves into believing that that's the easier route. You know, if we don't see it, then we can't possibly be affected by it. If we don't see it, then we are not responsible for changing it. Um, But it is impacting us and it's causing a huge detriment um, to ourselves, of course, and then also what we then do to others. Um, And the more conscious we become, the more freedom we actually get to experience. Um, And I think that that for many people, they miss that. They miss that understanding, that actually understanding how we oppress and are the oppressor is critical to our own freedom and, of course, then to the freedom of other people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I um, I was absolutely you know, one of those people without having any notion that I was, because I was always really passionate about these things, these issues. Um, but I, I grew up in a very white, very wealthy community. Mm. And, um, you know, I learned coping skills young, really young, like from five, if not earlier. Um, and so it's, it's, it's layered, you know, it's very complicated. I'm still unpacking pieces of me. I'm like, Oh fuck, that's in there. Like that thought. Uh-huh. <laughs> For real? Uh-huh. Oh, that's gross. Let's pluck that out, please. Um, but what people don't realize, what, what people of color particularly often miss is um, how painful it is. I mean, they don't miss it. I think it's really why we can put our blinders on. One, we put our blinders on because we were taught to, right? Because white supremacist patriarchy taught us to put our fucking blinders on and do what is required to be a quote unquote good and right person of color, model minority in order to survive, whether that's, you know, actual physical survival, which is very real, um, or to succeed and, and move through the, and navigate the, the fucking insanity that is white supremacy. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really important to have a lot of compassion for ourselves and understanding why we internalize our own oppression and take this, this inner script and dialogues on. Also, part of it isn't ours, right? It's ancestral, literally brought into this planet with it. It's not ours. It's our moms and grandmothers and great-grandfathers and all of that stuff. This stuff is old and ancient. Um, so, so much compassion for why we carry these stories and scripts and like why we perpetuate it. <clears throat> and then also the realization of like, yeah, I can see exactly what you said. It can seem so much easier to put the blinders on and keep going or pretend like it's not that bad if we don't acknowledge it mm-hmm. or, or um, view it any way, shape or form, but it's so painful. It's like this little, well, it's not that little, but it's like, um, it, you know, there's that comic that's gone, going around about um, microaggressions being a mosquito bite. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, mosquito bite. Okay, two, but it's like a thousand. And I feel like that's what what I call internalized oppression is. Like if, you know, when people of color are perpetuating white supremacy, that to me is just a, a result of colonization and colonialism and our own internalized oppression. And it's like, to me, it's like a woodpecker. Just And maybe you don't feel it. That's fine. Although I think that you do. Um, and it's just slowly chipping, chipping away at you until like, who are you and what do you have left of your, of yourself, you know? And what I'm really coming to the realization of like how, the, how painful it is to realize how small I was being, how small I allowed myself to get and how little I was showing up in the world um, because prioritizing whiteness and white people's comfort was the most important thing. Mm-hmm. That's what I was taught and that's what I was doing. And so in order to do that, I had to play small. I had to be quiet a lot. I you know, was constantly um, uh, subjected to spiritual bypassing and gaslighting and all of these weapons of violence um, to make me feel like it was me because there's no other people of color around mm-hmm. to say otherwise. And even when there are. Um, you know, we're still confronted with those, those harms. So it's a really challenging thing to move through. Um, I think it's a lifelong journey truly because we're really, we're really undoing, um, things that we were socialized to do from really young. And as I mentioned, it's like multidimensional. It's not only nurture. I believe part of it is nature. You know, they talk about post-traumatic slave disorder in the African-American populations. I'm Canadian, of course, but I, you know, same thing. You're on the North American continent as a black person, like you have some very significant trauma in your ancestral line. Wait, Rachel, I thought that uh, there was no racism in Canada. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> totally right. There is no racism in Canada because we have Justin Trudeau. Exactly. <laughs> I poke fun, but uh, there are a lot of Canadians who, you know, white Canadians who have said to me, there's no racism Mm -hmm. here. You know, this is a beautiful, a beautiful piece of land where we don't have that. And I was like, okay, well, you're white. So you're not actually of any way, shape or form in a position to tell me whether or not there is racism. Yeah, it is a really problematic um, perspective and you know Canadians just love to point their fingers down south and be like well look at what's going on in the United States with Trump and I'm like y'all we had Stephen Harper for 10 years we don't like to talk about it he was like Trump numero uno he was the devil (laughs) and Justin Trudeau is cute but he's not doing a hell of a lot for people of color that's for sure he's really violated uh, a lot of the things that he uh, pledged to do in in advancement of indigenous rights and really has violated and gone against a lot of those things so um highly highly problematic space for sure and where i lived it was it was exactly that it was like but the, what i don't see color it was like mm-hmm. the white white person proverb i heard all the time i'm like great so you don't see me mm-hmm. i'm not just erasure of <laughs> an invalidation of my lived experience and that's your white privilege that doesn't require you to take color into consideration and by the way you're a color too mm-hmm one of the things that we talked about before um we started the recording is the relationship between um, black women versus the relationship between white women. And I would love to hear more um, your thoughts on that. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just um, really, my heart is overflowing with the ways in which I see black women coming together, particularly around 
you know, in the space that I'm in. So I'll speak about the space I'm in. I won't speak for all black women everywhere. Although, you know, I love to do that. I can. <laughs> um, but I'm just really seeing women of color generally, but, but also just really specifically black women, because I think there's a, a large um, stigma or stereotype about black women, like tearing each other down and being really competitive and, you know, cause we're so angry and aggressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's just, just not the case. Like I have seen black women come together to uplift and support and go out of their way to really like do our sisters a solid in a way I've never seen or experienced with white women. So for example, my personal experience is, you know, there's so many women, incredible women in this like anti-racism, inclusion, racial justice space. And um, I have just had, it's been such a uh, uh, effortless and kind of almost instantaneous connection I've made with a bunch of women through Instagram, by the way, mm-hmm. um, with other black women in this space doing different things, you know, like Rachel Cargill is out there doing her thing, um, educating from a more academic space. And then Lisa Renee Hall, who you had on here, who I love um, doing her thing with writing and, you know, ancestral um, work and then Layla Saad, another friend, like all of these phenomenal women are so, so, so many. Shishi Rose and Sarah Clark and um, Dion Elizabeth, like there's just more than I can count. And we're all just like here for each other. You know, like I got you. What do you need? How can I help support you? And um, and I'm not, you know, I don't exist outside of white supremacist patriarchy. I wish I did, but I don't. I'm in it. And so there's still vestiges of like, oh, she's doing the same thing as me. Like, fuck. Um, you know, like that that competition mind, mm-hmm. evil mind creeps in without question, but it just gets so quickly melted. I find gets so quickly eradicated and melted away amongst black women. It's just like, no, no, we are all here for the betterment and advancement and advancement of each other and everybody else. Um, but we know that we have been the most overlooked. And so we are, we are looking out for each other. Like, mm-hmm. And that has just been um, just so nourishing and heartwarming. Like it makes me want to cry just talking about it. Um, and I've just never experienced that even with people you know, white women who were like friends in real life that I'd known from high school, like this instantaneous, deep connection, like ride or die connection Mm -hmm. um, that I've made and have with so many of these women has just been um, life-changing, really. It's been really life-changing. And I find um, all of these women, and there's many more who I I don't have connections with, but I feel quite confident if I reached out, like it's just... uh, uh, been a really nice uh, pattern um but they're so inspiring too and when i see their success i see my success Mm -hmm. and we just don't we don't see that enough right that's not what white supremacist patriarchy wants us to see or feel quite the opposite here's mentality it's fear it's competition there's not enough to go around she's doing what you're doing to take her down and it's just doesn't have to be that way like we can all be abundant and like your success is my success and you you're never going to do it exactly the way i am and i'm never going to do it exactly the way you do and we're all all of our voices are needed especially when it comes to racial justice like you cannot hear this conversation enough or from enough people mm-hmm. so that piece um is also really important because i also see a lot of white folks like picking right Mm-hmm. Hand picking who they follow and what they do, what the work they do, and I, I really want to very specifically say to the white folks who are listening: like, you need to do it all. <laughs> you need to listen to us all. We're all important. Mm-hmm. And what do you think is lacking, or do you feel like is not happening within white women's circles? Yeah, they don't love themselves. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. It's not funny really not many. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So so one of the biggest things I talk about in my workshop is that, you know, racism harms everybody, everybody, not equally, but it harms everyone. And like, as people of color, we have very obvious, we can easily point to the ways ways in which it harms us. You know, if we don't have our blinders on, some of us do. But for white folks, it can be like, well, how does this harm me? And I'm not saying that white folks don't benefit because they do. They all benefit from racism, white people. But it's also very harmful because 
it robs white people of peace. It robs them of a connection with themselves. It robs them of deep and meaningful connections with the majority of people on the planet. Because the majority of people on the planet are people of color. Um, and you Wait, have can to you say that. that? Can you say that one more time? I think that, that fact gets forgotten. Yeah. The majority of people on the planet are people of color. Mm-hmm. So if you're white and you aren't doing work, then you basically, if you're not doing anti-racism, then you're racist. Even if you are doing anti-racism, it's there. Um, so you're robbing yourself of deep and meaningful connections with the majority of people on the planet. Mm-hmm. Let that sink in for a second. This conversation freaks, you know, right-wing folks out to, to no end. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so it's really damaging. It's damaging to white people's psyche. It's damaging to their well-being, even though they have all these benefits, because that's the whole point of white supremacy, so that they can benefit and reap the rewards of, of privilege and power to the exclusion or oppression of people of color. And they do. But on like a soul, emotional, mental level, like it's fucked up. It fucks everybody up fucks everybody up because you have to then constantly be in a state of like defending and denying other people's humanity. And you can't do that without in some way, shape or form denying and detaching from your own humanity. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you can do that to other people and not, and and not in some way, shape or form do that to your own. And so long story short, I see that across, across, you know, white folks in general, there's like this lack of love for themselves and, and lack of compassion. And so if you don't have compassion for yourself, you absolutely cannot have compassion for other people. And so I specifically see that with white women, mm. this inability to have compassion for themselves. And so they cannot have compassion or empathy for other people, um, whether it's within their own race or uh, across racial lines. But yeah, this, and I, I'm by no means saying that, you know, black women don't compete with each other. We do. <laughs> we absolutely do. And, and, and it's, uh, again, to me, a product of internalized oppression of like fear and scarce mentality of being pitted against each other because we're at the, the bottom of the ladder and there's, there's not, we, we feel very deeply that there's not enough. And for many of us in many real situations, there isn't. Um, and so, um, you know, that's an important point to make, but yeah, with white women, I'm just seeing this like inability to cope like period mm-hmm. um, and an in- inability to understand the viewpoint or lens outside of their own because they've never had to. Mm-hmm. And so they, they've really been taught from like birth that like they should have whatever they want. Truly like you should and can have whatever you want. And so uh, if you if you're born with that sense of entitlement, then yeah, you're gonna think like, well, why should you have it and not me? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think if you were raised under um, under marginalization and oppression and discrimination, the the result can be quite different. Like, well, you know, why can't we all have? It's 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 possible. Yeah, it's interesting. I hear um, two kind of camps um, when it comes to talking about white women's complicity, right? There's the kind of, and there's a lot of overlap. So I'm not pinning one camp against the other. It's just, I'm seeing two different lenses of, of talking about white women, right? On, on the one hand, it's white women are complicit in upholding white supremacy and they know it, right? They know that they're doing it. Um, and they've, yes, they've been taught this, but now they know. They know and they're doing it knowingly um, because they reap the benefits, the power, the privilege. And then you have kind of the other camp, which is, well, women are really just the victim to the same system that we're all a victim to, which is the patriarchal white supremacy culture. And they don't know until they know, right? We don't know what we don't know. Um, most of us aren't born knowing, oh, right, I'm, I'm white, I have this power. Um, and then once you do know, though, you have a responsibility to, to do something with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's that whether or not we know or we don't know. And I notice um, that that can cause a lot of conversation. And I'm curious what your observations are about that conversation. Yeah, I think um, I agree. I think that there are those camps. And um, what I have to say about that? Um, I think right now, and sometimes I change my own mind, right? Um, But I think right now I feel like you can know and not know at the same time. Mm. So 
For example, Catrice Jackson, great mentor of mine, love her, another black woman doing phenomenal work. She, she um, talks about how white women, you know, claim that they didn't know and they're just waking up to this work. And she's like, oh, really? Oh, really? So if I could switch you now, 5, 10, 15 years ago with a black woman's life experience, if I could put you in the body of a black woman, you would have been fine with that before this conversation? Mm. And they all go, oh, no. Like, no, of course you fucking wouldn't because you know, you know, you may not know, but you know that it's harder. Mm -hmm. You know the pain that we endure on some level. You know it's worse. Mm -hmm. You know you wouldn't want it for yourself. You know that much. Whether you can name it or describe it, but you know you wouldn't want that for yourself. And so that is, I believe, true. And I believe that that is a sense of knowing for sure. But like whether I think subconsciously they all know in that way, like, oh, yeah, no, of course I wouldn't. Um, and then, of course, we can get into like the semantics of like what is knowing. Um, but I think sometimes consciously, like they really don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the long and short for me is like, I don't fucking care. <laughs> mm-hmm. I actually don't care. Do your work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and I get people like, well, you're in the, if you don't know those cars, you know, how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to realize that there's like a, a pile up on the highway if you don't even notice? And I'm like, well, how have you gotten through life as a full fledged functioning human? And you didn't notice you, you had your blinders on willfully is how I feel about it. So I don't really fucking care. Like get to work. Mm-hmm. You should have been at work hundreds of years ago. So just get to work now. Yeah, I hear that. I think that that's very, that's a very potent message and uh, it doesn't get, it needs to be like preached over and over and over again. It's like, okay, whether or not the past, whatever happened in the past done, like it's done. You know, you, you, there's not much more you can do about it. It's in the past, but uh, there's a lot that you can do to change your future. There's a lot that you can do to make a difference to undo the damage you've done in the past that happens in the future. And that means instead of sticking with obsessing over the past, like do the work now, do the work. I, now. I, I think it's just a defense. I think it's, um, it's white centering, mm. you know, why are we even having this conversation about whether you knew or not knew? Like, j- because you don't want to be seen as bad or wrong. Mm. And I don't fucking care about how you're being seen or viewed. Get to work. Mm-hmm. I have compassion for the feeling. And I talk about this a lot in my workshops. And I think that this is really important to acknowledge that this is, there's a lot of grief in the work of racial justice, obviously for people of color, because we're traumatized at the way white supremacist patriarchy treats us physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. But I think also for white folks, again, one, because um, for all the reasons I said, the ways in which white supremacist patriarchy hurts even white people, but also when you, and I see this in, in my work with clients, and, um, when white people come to the realization, like truly, and you, you, you know it when you see it, when they truly sit with the weight of the truth of like what white supremacist patriarchy does and the way in which they have caused harm and are perpetuating racism, and just so we're clear, I believe all white people are racist and benefit from racism and white supremacy. So it's not like I'm not singling anybody out. All of you, I, I blanket all of you equally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you can, I don't know, take refuge in that. Um, when you really sit with the weight of that, there's deep, deep mourning. There's grief, there's guilt, there's shame that you didn't know before, you were unwilling to know that you have caused harm, whatever harm you've caused, and you've undoubtedly caused harm, if you will, um, to whatever degree or extent. Like when you really sit with that, it's like you take the rose-colored lenses off and you, it's, for me, it's the matrix. You unplug from the matrix and you're like, oh, holy shit. Nothing is as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. I'm not who I thought I was. My identity is not what I thought it was. My, my, my feet are not on solid ground. Like nothing is as it was before. That if you're in that space to me as a white person, then like you are actually doing the work because mm-hmm. that's what it will be for you. Everything will shift. Um, and there's deep mourning in that. And I have compassion for it. I think it's important to, to make note of it, to acknowledge it and to honor it, not as cookies because I don't give out cookies, but 
because if we don't acknowledge and honor that peace, then the white people get stuck in it. They get stuck in the grief and the guilt and the shame, and then nothing gets done. Mm-hmm. Cause then they spend all of their time trying to trying to distance themselves from that feeling or distance themselves from whiteness. And like, they can't, right? <laughs> they can't do that. And it's important for us. This is like a larger issue that we don't talk about, I think, enough in this work. It's why what I call what I do spiritual activism. It's like this heart-centered, embodied way of doing this work. It's like, we need to learn how to get comfortable with our discomfort and to feel those feelings because those mm-hmm. feelings are information and we need to utilize that information for our growth, mm-hmm. for actual, like lasting, sustained change. So I am not... Um, against shame. I had someone recently message me and they're like, I want to put together a project that like, you know, is about love, not shame for white people. And I was like, "Mm, no. (laughs) Tell, tell this person to listen to, uh, I think it's like my fifth episode with Rachel Rice and Carmen Spagnola all about shame because there's some really, really important things that that person needs to know about shame that they're missing out on. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, my only issue with shame, I think shame can be very beneficial. My only issue with shame is when people get stuck in it. And I see what people exactly. get stuck in all the time. And like, exactly. that's not helping them. And that is sure as fuck not helping me. Yes. Now it's about you. Again, exactly. right centering. And you're not taking any action. And we're stuck. We're stuck here. So I honor and acknowledge the mourning, the loss, the grief, the guilt, the shame that is inherent in this work for white people for the purpose of being like, great, that's hard. I need you to feel those feelings and process that so we can move the fuck off. Because it pales in comparison to the trauma mm-hmm. and the violence that people of color have and can continue to endure every fucking day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting how I see the next kind of step uh, is a real desire to distance, you know, as white people distance ourselves from whiteness by, you know, calling all white people trash, you know, or, <laughs> or um, hating on all white people. Um, and I, I recognize that that's a phase, you know, and it, it passes and that I don't want us to get stuck there either. Because that can only be so helpful. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think white people are trash. (laughs) And people get confused because I'm like, they're like, but you said all white people are racist. I'm like, I sure did. (laughs) I think all white people are racist. I think all white people are white supremacists. And I by no means think all white people are bad or that they're trash. I think that that is the air that we breathe, white supremacist patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And you are born into that. And um, Amanda Seals is a phenomenal comedian. She talks about, she's like, there's white women. And then there's women who happen to be white. <laughs> <laughs> so white women are the women who are you know, walking around and they're just like, I don't know. And they're willfully blind or whatever. And they're just benefiting from their privilege left, right, and center. And they're like, I don't see color. They're those people. Those are like the white women. Mm. And then there's women who happen to be white. And they're like, oh. I was born on this, in this skin with all of this privilege. Okay. Um, well, I, what can I do to use my privilege to create change? Mm-hmm. And like, those are the white people I fuck with. Mm-hmm. I got a lot of white friends and, and they are those folks. Do you feel like people of color and white people can be friends? I do. <laughs> Sometimes I don't. <laughs> Sometimes I don't. Um, but I abs- I do. I do. I think it's really, really challenging. I think there's always, always going to be emotional uh, violence or harm that takes place in that relationship because mm. of the nature of, of racism and white supremacy. I think the majority of white folks are not doing their work or adequate work to be in meaningful relationships that are actually nourishing and supportive to people of color. Mm. Um, so, like, it's hard-pressed. Um, but... I, I do believe it's possible. I have relationships where that's the case. Um, are any of them perfect? No. Is any relationship I have with anyone perfect? No. Um, I, 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 I strongly believe that we have the capacity to um, live in a world where we can cause less harm. And I think I'll, I'll, that being said, I don't have any judgments around folks who feel differently. And I know folks who feel differently. I know folks of color who are like, I don't have white friends. I've tried it's every single time like without question, 
you know, harm gets done and I'm just done. And I'm like, cool, totally understand and respect that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also don't want us to get to a place where we segregate ourselves and that allows white folks to be let off the hook. You know, I think it's so hard because when you segregate, then the way I think that white people change is through witnessing Mm -hmm. other people's humanity. And so we're already isolated enough, right? That, that is literally how bigotry starts is because of that Mm -hmm. isolation. It's because I've never seen a black person or like, I've never been in the same room with the gay person. So I can make up all these stories about what Mm -hmm. that means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So I feel like isolation begets bigotry, but at the same time, like forcing, you know, black people to be friends or to be in, in social context with white people is can, can create, it's like um, creating so much harm. Um, So it's like, where is that balance? Well, two things. One, I recently learned that two thirds of white people do not have any meaningful relationship with a person of color. Mm. So let that sink in. I was like, oh, that makes sense. Because honestly, questions that I field from white folks all the time, I'm like, do you think we're aliens? Like, why are you asking this question? You know, like, well, how do I ask? Do I? I'm like, we're not, we're human. Like, we're not fucking chimpanzees over here. Why is this such a hard, sometimes it's like really staggering to me how, uh, but that makes sense. I'm like, oh, if you don't have any meaningful relationship with a person of color, of course you've like, you literally don't even know how to talk to us. Like, you have no yeah. clue. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's an important f- an important piece because a it's like yeah we actually already are segregated (laughs) clearly um but the flip side of that is that people of color are it's very rare for a person of color to be able to get away with moving through the world without having some form of a meaningful connection with a white person you know whether it's your doctor or um your uh parole officer or um, someone representing you in the judiciary system or um like your pharmacist like whatever the hell it is like we can't yeah. escape whiteness or mm-hmm. white people really like even if we want to. So, um, so there's that fact. That's an important piece. Um, and then there's this piece that like, I think it's, I think it's really important. What I was going to say before is like, I don't want white folks to feel like they get let off the hook for not trying. And that is something that I've seen in my own personal life a lot. Like, well, you know, I've had folks who used to be very close friends who've said things to me like, um, I don't feel like I can be a friend to you. And I'm like, no, you just don't want to try. <laughs> mm. You're just not hearing or you just do that. like a total cop out. Like, because now I have different boundaries and expectations of what's okay and what's not okay. And I'm showing up differently and you don't really like it because it's challenging you and who you are. Um, and so you just don't want to try. But that's not about b- me not being open to it. I'm absolutely open to it. It's you just not even trying. Yeah. So let's be really fucking clear about that because that happens all the time. Um, and then the thing that I do in my workshops um, that, you know, from what folks have told me is really groundbreaking and important is I, um, my one-on-one workshops are with white people and folks of color intentionally to do exactly what you said before. It's like, we need to have conversations where white, we don't need to do anything, but it's helpful to have conversations where white folks see people of color as human. Yes. And actually hear our experiences. And let me be clear, the workshop is not so that white people can hear our experiences and view us as humans. That is the offshoot of it. But it's it's for white folks to have an understanding of race and racism. But more importantly, it's for people of color to feel fully seen, heard, and supported and to voice their pain in a space where it will actually be heard. Yes. And where they, they are prioritized. Yes. And so that's what I do, whether it's online or in person. And I make sure that that's really first and foremost front first and foremost front and center regardless of the space that i'm creating it's like people of color come first our well-being including my own comes first whiteness in this space will come second there will be no violence in my space or mm-hmm. can never say no because there always will be but i i don't ha- i don't have a tolerance for it and i you know always reserve the right to kick you the fuck out yeah. if if it's ongoing and you're causing harm and so i bring this up only because what folks of color say to me after they've attended is like, I've never ever in my entire life been in a space where I have felt prioritized and safe where other white people have been ever. Yeah. And so I just want to say, a, I mean, it makes me cry even want to even saying that because I know that to be true of my, for myself too. When you're in a space with white people where you feel like you are a priority, 
where you're uplifted and supported, where your needs are put first, you know, like never. And so it's possible. It's possible because I've seen it and I create it. Mm -hmm. But it's obviously harder to do when we're just out in the world. But again, I'm just coming back to this, like, we can't just let people off the hook. It's possible. It just takes work. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are you willing to do the work? Yeah. Oh, any final thoughts before we wrap up? You know, I think we solved it. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, I think so too. I mean. (laughs) Oh, I wish, right? (laughs) I know. God, wouldn't that be great? It would. (laughs) You know, I read this really, um, this like, quote popped up on my Instagram today and it was like, you know, people keep saying that we, why are you playing the race card? And mm. I'll just end it with that. Yeah. Like, why are, why are you playing the race card? And this woman was like, and this really, like really, really struck home for me. I reposted it in my stories. It was like, I don't do this for cookies. I don't do this because this is like helpful for me. It is helpful for me personally, but it's deeply painful to take on this work and to be a voice for marginalized and oppressed peoples. Like it comes at great personal harm and cost to me, but I do it because it's for the emancipation and liberation of all of us as humans. Mm. And most specifically, you know, people of color, the most marginalized and oppressed. So I just, um, I don't know, that just popped into my mind, but I think it's, it's just so important. This work is all day. It's every day. It's never ending. And um, it's exhausting, but it's also necessary and also so nourishing and freeing all at the same time. Yeah. Thank you for the work that you do and for sharing your wisdom here with us and the listeners of Reclaim. Um, it's really, really appreciated. Thank you. What an honor. 